I want to talk about these elements of the Passover. The unleavened bread is an important aspect of Passover because it represents the hurried departure of the Israelites out of Egypt. They did not have time to let the bread rise. They had to make it and bake it and go. And leaven came to represent sin. So when Jesus offered this unleavened bread as his body, he is offering it and it is representing his sinlessness. Unleavened bread, no leaven, no sin. So the bread, the unleavened bread is as the body of Christ is representing his sinlessness. The bitter herbs on this um, bread represent the bitter slavery and hard labor and oppression that the Israelites endured in Egypt. So at a Passover meal, they would taste this and think of the bitterness that the Israelites endured. We can taste this bitterness and think of the bitter suffering that Jesus endured, the suffering he endured at the hand of his betrayer, Judas, and the suffering that he endured because of our sins. So that's just something that we can remember with this bitter herb taste, that horseradish. And then the fruit of the vine, that's the name that is given to the special wine that is served at Passover. Jesus used that phrase in the Bible. That's the way it's recorded, the fruit of the vine. So even then they called it that. Jews today will tell you it's not very good wine. <laughs> that's because of the way that it's fermented and it is specially prepared for Passover. It is fermented naturally without additives to speed up the fermentation. The regular Passover meal that Jesus celebrated and that Jews celebrate today includes the recognition of four cups of the fruit of the vine. And the whole Passover meal begins with the first cup of blessing. And it's also called the cup of sanctification. The second cup is the cup of judgment, or it might be known as the cup of plagues. The third cup is the cup of redemption. And the fourth is the cup of praise. Now I'm going to show you a chart that is similar to the chart in your workbook on page 28. You noted the declaration that Jesus made when he shared the first cup of the fruit of the vine. He said, I will not drink it again until the kingdom of God comes. That is the first cup of blessing or sanctification. So it was the very first cup that was shared at the meal. In Matthew, Mark, and John, those Gospels tell us about the betrayer dipping his bread in the bowl with Jesus. And that may have been dipping the bread into the bitter herbs. So that, um, I've added that into our chart. The bread that Jesus shared as his body is offered after the full meal has been eaten. In today's Passover program or a Seder, if you were to attend that, this particular bit of bread is called the afikomen. It has been hidden away and then it is pulled out and it's a portion of bread. So that is what Jesus shared when he said, this is my body. And again, it was after the meal. And then he shared the third cup of the fruit of the vine. And Jesus called this the cup of the new covenant. We know it in the Passover program as the cup of redemption. And you can see how that fits together. The cup of redemption and the cup of the new covenant. That's, that's the same thing. So um, that's all that is described in the Gospels regarding the elements that Jesus had in his hands and what the disciples partook of. Well, now that you've had a little taste of the Passover meal, we're going to consider the eternal significance of that meal. And I've got a few more things to share with you before any fill in the blank starts. So you can just, just keep listening. <laughs> uh, Dwight Pentecost has a book called The Words and Works of Jesus Christ. And he begins his discussion of the events of the Last Supper by saying, a blast from the silver trumpets blown in the temple complex announced to all Jerusalem that the Passover had arrived. 
That hour found Jesus and his apostles reclining at the table that had been prepared for this occasion. So there was a sound that they heard. They knew it was time. The room was prepared. They are all together. Who was in that upper room when the Passover began? Well, I'm going to remind you by giving you the list of them. Jesus was there, of course, and for possibly the first time, we know he had always attended Passover, but this may have been the first time that he ever led the feast. And then Peter and John were there. We know they had both been busy that day and maybe the day before making all the arrangements, finding the water boy in Jerusalem and taking the lamb to the temple to be sacrificed. They located the house in the upper room and they made sure everything was ready for the rest of the disciples who showed up. And they were John's brother, James, and Peter's brother, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. And it's just fascinating, isn't it, to think of him being there. He had to be there. The traitor. None of the disciples knew what Judas had been up to that week. He came along to the Passover celebration with everybody else, just like everybody else. So these 12 men were with Jesus in the upper room. And we know from Luke 22:15 that Jesus eagerly, intensely desired to share this Passover with his disciples. Now you can start taking notes <laughs> if you like to do that. All Passovers looked back to the redemption of the Israelites out of slavery. This redemption out of slavery was a physical deliverance of the people out of Egypt. But it wasn't just deliverance out of something. It was redemption for them. It was deliverance to the status of being a nation who belonged to God. So I want you to keep that in mind. It looked back. It was deliverance out and deliverance to Every Passover, all Passovers looked back to that and looked forward to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who would redeem and deliver Israel and Gentiles out of sin. As the Israelites celebrated Passover through the years, biblical history, I'm not saying that they knew that it was looking forward. They were always looking back. But when we look back, we know that it was painting the picture and looking forward to what Jesus would do. The sacrifice of Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, also accomplished the redemption and deliverance out of something and to something, to a brand new relationship. And that is described in the prophesied new covenant. So Jesus' Passover took them out of and brought them into this brand new relationship. Jesus understood all of this as no one else in the room could. So he eagerly desired to share this Passover and he rejoiced in what he was about to accomplish. Wow, he knew what his sacrifice would bring. There were many dynamics going on in the upper room because of the magnitude of the evening. First of all, Judas had a secret. He had already agreed to hand over Jesus. Nobody knew it was him. The rest of the disciples were engaged in the celebration of Passover. Remember, it is a celebration, a joyous time. Jesus washed their feet, and that was a humbling moment. He made a disconcerting announcement to Peter that he would deny him. Wow. And Jesus brought an ominous tone to the evening when he said that he would be betrayed. So there's a lot going on in the upper room, so much. I mentioned in my previous lecture that Luke is not always chronological. Not always chronological. 
you're reading along and it, it seems like it, but when we look at other accounts, we see things in different orders. Matthew and Mark place Jesus' comments about the betrayer and his dipping in the bowl before Jesus' new covenant declarations. Luke didn't do that. Uh, John, the Gospel of John, indicates that Judas left in the middle of the Passover meal. So if you'll remember, I said the meal is eaten and then the afikomen, that bit of bread, is shared. So Jesus would have shared that and made that statement about the bread. This is my body. That's after the meal. And Judas would have already left the room. Luke summarizes and condenses details. He never mentions that Judas leaves the room. So when you read about the Last Supper, it sounds in Luke like Jesus, um, like Judas is in the room when Jesus declares that the bread is his body and the cup of wine is his blood. It sounds like Judas is still there. But Luke uses some small and mighty key Greek words to highlight that someone will not belong to the New Covenant family. Luke 22, 21, the words are, But, behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with me on the table. These two words draw attention to the contrast between the disciples who believed in Jesus and the one who betrayed him. So those two words are used just after Jesus has said, This, is, this bread is my body, and this is the cup of the new covenant. But, behold... The hand of one betraying me is with me on the table. I have been referring to Daryl Bach's two-volume, really fat commentary on Luke. He is like the modern-day expert on the Gospel of Luke, and he defends it against skeptics. He explains that Luke very likely rearranged multiple sources and summarized the declarations of the evening. And we can notice, because we know the full story. Luke doesn't mention the washing of feet. And Luke doesn't mention the question that Peter asked John, ask him who the betrayer is. So Luke doesn't give us every single detail and every single, every single comment that is made in the upper room during the Last Supper. Bach states that what um, Luke may have written about the Passover meal and New Covenant declarations first and this emphasizes them and gives prominence to Jesus' final statements. Box says, Luke delayed raising the betrayal issue until after the meal and reduced its report to a bare minimum. And there's the bare minimum, Luke 22, 21. That's all that Luke says about Judas at the table in the upper room during the Passover meal. So we're going to do what Luke did. We're going to keep our interest on the betrayal at a bare minimum today. You had a full lesson in your homework discussion about his, uh, Judas's motivation and the satanic influence on him. So now we're going to fix our eyes and our thoughts on the reason that Jesus was so eager for this Passover meal. Just to reiterate it. Luke 22, 19 and 20, when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup, which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I still have to stop and just think about it and absorb it and be thankful for what Jesus said and did and how he did it. Every time I'm reading these words, he took some bread and gave thanks. Knowing what he was about to say and knowing what he was about to undergo, knowing what the de next day would hold. He took the bread and wine and presented it as his body and his blood. And then he said something no one was expecting to hear. This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. They didn't mention that at Passover. Now Jesus is talking about the new covenant. The new covenant was inaugurated. And that's a key word for us to see and understand. It was inaugurated with the shedding of Jesus' blood. 
An inauguration ceremony marks the beginning of something new. So that's what's going on. We've got Jesus starting something new with his sacrifice of himself. Jesus declared with his actions that it was time for the new covenant to be established, to begin to go into effect. He made that announcement. And then, as we learned last semester from John 14 through 16, Jesus explained during the rest of the evening, the Holy Spirit would be sent from heaven to indwell each person who believes in him. That's the key in the new covenant. So when he was talking about the Holy Spirit, he was explaining the new covenant to them. The Holy Spirit is the minister of the new covenant. He's the one who does all the work. He administrates the new covenant. He carries it out. The Holy Spirit who indwells each believer is the one who carries out all the promises of the new covenant. I hope to help us understand what this means for us today, believers today, and answer these questions. How is it that the nation of Israel was promised that they would receive the blessings of the new covenant and we, the church, today are recipients of this blessing? How is it that way? Do we receive all of the blessings that were promised to Israel? I have read Dr. Larry Pettigrew's book, The New Covenant Ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he addresses various perspectives that deal with these issues of the Holy Spirit, the New Covenant, Israel, the church. He gives perspectives and problems, and, and then he gives a sound doctrinal conclusion. And he gives these three ground rules for understanding what I'm about to tell you next. So first of all, ground rules we need. The Old Testament text must not be stripped of their original meaning. You can open the Old Testament and read it, and there is an explanation or an understanding of that text right there. We know more now, but you can understand what is said in the Old Testament by reading the Old Testament alone. The term Israel stands for the covenant nation in both biblical history and predictive prophecy. And that is to say that Israel means the nation of Israel. Israel means Jewish people. The promises, the new covenant promises were made to actual Israelite people. And new covenant promises will be fulfilled for actual Israelite people. Sounds like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. But I'm just trying to um, say Israel means Israel. <laughs> Israel means Jewish people. The third thing is the church is a distinct, it's a different entity that began at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on those who believe in Jesus as the Son of God and Savior. Put it another way, the church did not replace Israel. The church did not become Israel. Israel is Israel and the church is the church. But the church does include Jews, but that doesn't make the church become Israel. All right, so those are three ground rules, and now we'll keep going. Uh, I'm going to get specific on what the New Covenant actually is. You looked at this in your homework. You don't have any fill-in-the-blanks because I had so much to say. I just put it all on your handouts for you. These promises are based on Jeremiah 31 and 32 and Ezekiel 36 and 37. You saw and wrote those promises in your homework, but I wanted to give you this list in this itemized way. <clears throat> Number one, the new covenant is an irrevocable contract that God made with the nation of Israel. It's irrevocable because God himself said he would do it. He's owning all the responsibility. There is not a requirement of action on the part of Israel or on our part. We just receive. The new covenant, number two, is referred to by other names such as the everlasting covenant, a new heart and a new spirit, the covenant of peace, and my covenant. That's how it's referred to in the Old Testament, and we see in the New Testament it's also called a better covenant. Number three, the provisions of the new covenant are A, transformation through a new heart. And this is the key 
aspect of the new covenant. The Mosaic covenant did not change the people on the inside. B is fin final forgiveness of sins. And final means final. Sin is dealt with. This is why this covenant is new and different and better than the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant required sacrifices to be offered continually, day after day, year after year. The sacrifices required by the Mosaic covenant were a reminder of sins year after year. The new covenant gives a final forgiveness of sins. The new covenant is also God's consummation of his relationship with Israel. God had said to Israel, and this is part of the promise through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I will be your God and you will be my people. That's what he always wanted with Israel. But they always rejected him. They turned away from him. The new covenant promised a future kingdom of God with a perfect king, Jesus. And all the people in this kingdom of God will have new hearts so that they can know and love and obey God and be in this perfect relationship with him. D, the uh, provisions of the new covenant are physical and material blessings on Israel. These are very specifically described in Jeremiah 31, 8 through 40. And this was a specific promise made to the nation of Israel. You cannot get away from the fact that God spoke through Jeremiah and said this to the nation of Israel. And what did they include? The gathering of the people to the land, productivity when they're in the land, they're going to work and do good work. Things are going to go well. There will be expressions of joy for so many reasons. It's going to be so great. So much joy to be in the presence of the Lord the right way. There will be increase in herds and flocks. Sin, sickness is all uh, reduced greatly. So there's lots of health in the animals. And there's need for those herds and flocks for all the people that are gathered together in Israel. And there's the rebuilding of cities. So those are some of the material blessings. The next on the list, or the next two on the list, are spiritual blessings. The permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is how that first uh, provision actually takes place. A, the transformation of the new heart. It takes place by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He moves in, cleanses, and changes our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit in us giving us a new heart, making us a new creation. And F is related to that, the law inside the believer. We get the law written on our hearts because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The law is God's ways, his teachings, his will, what God wants. It's not written on stone anymore, on the outside. It's written on the inside, on our hearts. And that means that obeying God is not an external duty that someone's telling you you have to do. It is on your heart, in your heart. It's your heart's desire. So you want to obey the Lord. So you want to know his ways. And you can. He is making it known to us through his word. Dr. Pettigrew makes the statement. The New Testament reaffirms that the Lord's covenants with Israel are irrevocable. So we've just seen a list and we've seen spiritual blessings and physical blessings. Israel hasn't received either of them as a nation yet. So are they going to get them? Romans 11, 25 through 29 says, uh, Paul says, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation. And the mystery is, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So we're in a period of time where there's a partial hardening happening to Israel. How is it partial? Well, it's partial because there are some Jews who have come to know Jesus as their Messiah, their Savior. And we are in the time of the fullness of the Gentiles, and it has to come to its end time. And it hasn't come yet. And when it does, verse 26, all Israel will be saved. 
just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, the Jews. Paul's talking about Jews who are enemies of Jesus at this time. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they, the Jews, the Israelites, are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So irrevocable is a Bible word, unchangeable, undeniable. They're going to happen. He's not going to take it back. He won't revoke his covenant with Israel. And now I'm going to return to a question that I asked a minute ago. Dr. Pettigrew asks this question and answers it. How does the church get to benefit from the new covenant that was made especially for Israel, with Israel? How does the church benefit from it? And I've given you this quote on your handout. He's, uh, Dr. Pettigrew says, the most biblically informed solution is that the church participates in the new covenant, but the new covenant will not be finally fulfilled until Israel comes into a right relationship with God and its Messiah at the end of the tribulation. The church does not participate in the land blessings and may not have full benefit of the spiritual blessings because the king is not yet here on earth ruling from Jerusalem. If we're looking back at that Romans passage, we are in that time of mystery, and that's the church participating in the new covenant while there's a partial hardening of Israel. I also now want to think of an analogy. Like, what's going on? How can we understand Israel and the church and how... Israel is really getting all the good stuff, but the church is getting some good stuff too. That's putting it lightly, the good stuff. Okay, I want to compare it to a surprise birthday party. So, surprise birthday party is planned. All the invited guests have gathered at the home where the surprise is going to happen. The guests are together. They're having a good time. Maybe they're having some appetizers. They get something, but they cannot go full into the meal and they can't cut the birthday cake and really get the party going yet. They're waiting for the birthday girl, the honored guest. So when she walks in the door, surprise now, full blown party time. All is available. Dinner served, the guests and the honored guests are partaking. The birthday girl's gonna receive her gifts. Maybe they play some games and they cut the cake and enjoy cake together. And maybe there's even singing and dancing because it's time for everybody to have a good time at this party. So the church is the invited guests who are there waiting for the birthday girl, Israel, to show up. So they get to have a good time. They know what's coming when the honored guest, when the birthday girl shows up. When we look at the specific promise of the new covenant, and that specific promise is the indwelling Holy Spirit, we can trace from Ezekiel to John to Acts and then throughout the New Testament letters, individual believers who are now collectively known as the church receiving that aspect of the new covenant. It's clear. Those who have trusted Christ receive the Holy Spirit. And that is one of the blessings, the key aspect of the new covenant. You can also see by looking at Acts and the history of the church that the physical blessings of the new covenant were not given to the church. The history of the church shows us that right off the bat, Christians, and many of them were Jews, were persecuted in Jerusalem by the Jews. Jews in Israel, who were participants of the new covenant, were persecuted. And they didn't say, y'all need to leave, this is our land, God gave it to us, get out. Actually, Christians began to leave Israel. The territory of Israel was taken over by Rome, and eventually Christians were persecuted by various Roman emperors. They're not enjoying peace in the land and prosperity in the land. 
the gospel spreads. Gentiles are included in the new covenant. These new believers who are forming the church, perhaps in Ephesus, Thessalonica, all over Asia Minor and Greece, they didn't say, ah, we've received the new covenant. We're moving back to Israel. The land is ours. Th they didn't do that. They stayed. They spread. It's true. Some Christians throughout history have moved back to Israel, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But for the most part, the Holy Land that God promised to Israel has been a war zone. And we know that very well at this point in time right now. It has been taken over by one nation after another. The church has not gone back to Israel to say, God promised us this land in the new covenant and everybody else get out. God said he would regather his people. And it does seem that he is doing that more and more, bringing Israelites, Jews, back to the land of Israel now. And this is in preparation for the final events in the end times. We don't know when the end times are going to be here. But the day is coming when Jews who know Jesus as their Messiah will be in the land of Israel and they can get a seven-year calendar and get a countdown to the next Passover that Jesus will celebrate with them. And that will be during the kingdom of God, the millennial kingdom, when he is reigning as king. He says he's going to celebrate the Passover again. Can you imagine the delight of that Passover celebration? We will be in our glorified bodies at that time. And perhaps we will be involved in serving. I know we will be rejoicing with those as they celebrate Passover then. Until then, what do we do? Jesus told us, take the bread and the fruit of the vine in remembrance of him. Paul says, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim, we acknowledge, we declare his sacrifice for us. And the inauguration of the new covenant, and we're recipients of the new covenant now. The book of Hebrews goes into great detail about the new covenant. It describes our high priest who sacrificed himself and gave his blood to cleanse our consciences from sins and dead works. And after 12 chapters of discussion of the, new, the better covenant, saying don't go back to the old ways, we have something new and better. The author of Hebrews describes how we should live as members of the kingdom of this new covenant. So keep in mind that the new covenant does make you a citizen of the kingdom of God. So I want to close now with a list of what the author of Hebrews gives us as practical daily responses to being recipients of the new covenant. It starts in Hebrews 12, 28. He says, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. There's one. Absolutely. Give thanks. By which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And now I've given you on your handout this list. Um, let love of the brothers continue. Brotherly love in the family of God. Show hospitality to strangers. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. And that's referring to those who are persecuted believers, Christians who are persecuted. Remember them, care for them, pray for them. Marriage is to be held in honor. Be content with what you have. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you and imitate their faith. Don't be carried away by strange teachings. Bear the reproach of Jesus. This is for his name's sake. Let others know who he is to you, even if it causes reproach upon you. Continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Do not neglect doing good and sharing. And obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. So we receive the blessing, the spiritual blessings of the new covenant, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it 
He, the Holy Spirit, changes our lives. And this is what our lives as believers, as members of the kingdom of God, should look. The author of Hebrews closes with this benediction, and I'll share it with you now. It's just, it's so totally appropriate for everything that we've been talking about. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And now let me close in prayer. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for your perfect plan throughout all time, um, outside of time and in time. Thank you for what you allow us to see and learn from your word. And um, I thank you for the history of the Passover. I thank you for what we have learned as the background and then um, all the promises that Jesus knew that he was bringing into fulfillment by offering the cup of the new covenant and himself. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice of yourself. We cannot fathom how great your sacrifice was, but we say thank you for what you have given us for this gift, this blessing. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in and changing us. And thank you for the future that is promised where we were all gathered together with your people, Israel, with you as our God and we as your people. We praise you, holy God. And Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen.